Now, over recent years, it's actually been getting more difficult to get into gaming, whether it's on a game's console or on the PC, it doesn't really matter. Both platforms have actually been increasing in price quite a bit, and that's mainly down to components and the fact that things are moving on. But recently, with the price increases of things like the PlayStation 5, it's actually making more sense to actually give PC gaming a go. And for those of you out there that have always been on a games console and never really tried to have a gaming PC or setup, Today's video is going to be a bit of a simple guide to show you exactly what you need to get, as well as how to configure some of the basic stuff. Now there are a number of reasons why somebody would want to switch from a games console to a PC and it's not just down to the cost, even though things can cost like for like nowadays because for the price of a games console, a brand new one, you can actually build yourself a pretty semi-decent PC that would kind of match it on performance anyway. There's also things like you don't want to be locked into a single ecosystem. The PC is obviously the platform of freedom. You've got so many different launchers, you've got different operating systems. And you can also configure your system and customize it however you actually want. But of course, to be able to start things off, you do need that machine. There are multiple different types of systems that you can go for. We're not going to include the laptop today because that's kind of an all in one system. It kind of speaks for itself, really. So your options, really, if you are going to get into PC gaming, come down to these two here. Now, the first one is a mini PC. This is just a basic mini PC that we have. It's from a company called Chewy. These are great for those that want to get into entry level gaming, but they won't match the performance of, say, your PlayStation 5 Pro or not yet. Anyway, they are getting better over time. It is a low cost option if you are buying brand new that you can pick these up and you can play lots of different PC games and you will be out of the PlayStation or the Xbox ecosystem. So they are actually a great starting point for a lot of people out there that want to kind of play a bit of old games, maybe some indie games and kind of get used to the platform itself. The most common though will actually be a system like this. Now this is a full desktop PC and we recently built this in a different video. You can go watch that if you want to. It will actually give you a decent performance all round on every game that you can possibly start because this system will play every game and it wouldn't cost a lot at all. You could probably build this system for around five to 550 pounds. So of course that kind of lands straight in the middle of the games console kind of ranges. You can also buy lots of different types of gaming PCs. This is a custom build here in a custom built case with all the different components that we put together, but you can buy pre-builds out there. They're often a little bit more expensive than doing it yourself, but that means that somebody will put it all together for you, install your operating systems and stuff like that. So it can be the easier option if you are somebody that's completely new to it and you don't know how to build a PC. But overall, this is basically the unit that you will need. And this is the one that we're going to continue on with the video so that you can see how we can get things done. The next thing you will need is, of course, a monitor. You will need something to display your gaming PC on. And today we're going to be using this one here. This is the AMZ Fast AMZ G27C1 Pro. PC monitors and gaming monitors in particular do have some very weird names. They're very kind of numbery here. So you will need to look into this a little bit more. Just like the PCs, there's going to be lots of different options out there for these. This one in particular is a 27 inch curved screen. It is only a 1080p monitor, which actually pairs very nicely to the system that we've got today. It has an IPS based technology for the LCD display, which is actually pretty good. It's usually better than the normal and the older VA panels, as well as a 240 hertz maximum refresh rate. Now that is actually going to be able to provide you with a competitive edge, particularly if you are a multiplayer game and something that most televisions don't actually support unless you're spending thousands of pounds on them. This monitor here actually offers great value as well because it's got all the connections that you need. It's got a nice big display and you can pick them up roughly for around 100 to 120 pounds now. So absolutely nowhere near the cost of a TV. But again, like everything else that we're showing today, there are many different options you can get for monitors. You can get big ones, small ones. You can get IPS panels, VA panels. You can also get OLED panels. And of course, they can also go up in resolution up to from 1080p to 4K or even a lower refresh rate of around 144 hertz. That's what most people tend to go for nowadays, all the way up to I think you can get monitors for 500 hertz now, but this is a good all round mid range type of monitor that will pair beautifully with the machine that we've got. Now, of course, the last piece of hardware that you really need is going to be slightly different to the games consoles that you're used to. In particular, you will need a keyboard and mouse for a gaming PC. And I've picked this one up here. This is actually a nice little budget set from uh, 
Red Devil, I believe the brand is. It's not something that I'm completely interested in when it comes to gaming PCs and mice and stuff, but you can get these nice ones with RGB lighting and stuff like that. The mouse and keyboard that you use on your system are of course going to be a personal choice because they're going to feel different and they're also going to have different costing. This one cost around £30 for the complete setup. That's not too bad in my opinion. It will get you up and running, but some people out there do like some really expensive stuff. The best advice I can give you if you want to get something that's a little bit more fine-tuned to your needs is to actually go try your friends kits if you have other friends that play on gaming pcs and things like that go try out their keyboards and mice because you're really going to actually feel the difference when you do that and then of course you purchase whichever ones that are within your budget that you actually like you also do have the option just like a games console to play with a games controller most controllers from any games console will actually work on a pc they usually connect via bluetooth or wi-fi or you can just throw in a cable and just use a cable as well this one here is of course from an xbox one this is probably one of my favorite types of controllers particularly for pc games i play all of my games on a pc with a controller so i can get away with it but if you are playing competitively you probably want to stick with your keyboard and mouse most people will have both of these and they'll switch between them depending on the games that they play again PlayStation 4 controllers also work, or you can buy from a range of PC compatible controllers, all made by all different brands. My advice again for the controller is definitely go check one out. If you're already on an Xbox, maybe that is the one that you keep, and that's the one you continue on with because you'll be used to it and you'll know how everything feels. But apart from that, we've got a way of controlling our PC, we've got a way of displaying our PC, and we've got the PC itself. So let's go get it hooked up and show you some of the quirks around that too. Okay, so once you've found some desk space, just like this one here, we will need to build the monitor first. Most monitors will come with their own stands, although you can get different stands for them where you kind of hook it onto the desk and, and kind of mount it that way. But I'm going to use the actual stand that came with this monitor. It does come in two pieces here. So we've got the base piece there and we've got the up stand where the monitor is actually going to click onto. Very simple to actually put this together. All we need to do is just insert it into the base and then on the bottom, You've actually got this little turn screw that you can use your hand or you can use a screwdriver to do it. I'm just going to use my hand to do this because it's usually tight enough to be able to do that. So we'll just tighten that up and squish it around there. Pop the little stand on there for now and we'll just grab the panel. We'll flip that over and as you can see we do have a slot in the back here where that is actually going to slot into. If we actually turn it over as well, you can see the inputs and outputs on this. Now we've got one DP connection here. We've got one HDMI. We've got a headphone jacket and a DC in. So with your monitor, you will also get some extra pieces. Most monitors nowadays will come with what they call a DP connection. We will need this one if we want to get the full potential of this monitor all the way up to the 240 hertz. Most of you out there coming from console will be used to something like this. This is a HDMI connection. You could use that one if you're not going to go up to the full 240 hertz. If you only want something like a 60 FPS experience, you can get away with just using a HDMI. I mostly use HDMIs, but now and again, I will use a DP connection. We're going to use the one that actually came with the monitor because that way we know it will work properly. And then, of course, you get a power connection. Now, sometimes monitors will use a power connection like the kettle plug, as we call it here in the UK. Same as the one that the machine will use. That will actually work in the bottom there. A lot of budget monitors will come with its own little DC connection like this. And that one will simply just go into that slot. Very easy to install these. For the DC one, just slots in. Even for the DP one, it's kind of slots in. You do have this ability to have a button on it. There is a button, but that's actually to take it out and not put it in. When you put it in there, you need to line it up because it's a funny shape. Line it up correctly and then just slot it into the monitor. But before we plug that in, we will need to get this onto a stand. Now turn the machine around here because I want to show you the back of it. This is where it gets a little bit different to a games console because very often their IO on the back is pretty straightforward and clear. You can just plug two or one or two things in usually and you're pretty much good to go. But with a PC, you have a lot more options and sometimes it can become a little bit overwhelming. So it's always worth going through where to actually plug stuff in so you know that when you're doing it, you're getting it right. The first thing that we're going to point out here is the power supply in our system. It is in the back of the system, not at the bottom. Most cases will have it at the bottom here, but we're using a dual chamber. So they actually mount the power supply in the back. You will get a kettle plug just like this one here. We call them kettle plugs here in the UK because we used to plug them into kettles years ago. Nowadays, I'm not sure what the actual name for them are. I'm sure it is a standard of some description, but basically you will just push it straight into the hole on the power supply there. You will also want to make sure once you've done that, that you have the system turned on. 
Lots of people forget to do this. And then when they come to power up the system, they've got nothing and they'll spend hours trying to fix things. But generally it's usually because that switch needs to be turned on. If you're buying a pre-built system, they may already be turned on or they may have switched it off for transport or something like that. So definitely worth checking that when they're there. The rest of it can get a little bit overwhelming, like I say, because this piece here is our motherboard IO shield. This is where we've got all our sound connections, our accessory connections, usually using USB. We've also on this motherboard here got two display port connections. Now we don't want to use them. A lot of people again will make the mistake of plugging into these and then you're using either your iGPU or your APU to actually present the picture on the screen and, and that's what it's going to use to render games and stuff. You will get very low performance from that, particularly if you have invested in a discrete graphics card. So of course, you definitely want to be plugging into here. If you are using a DP connection like we are, all you need to do is just slot it into the system, just like you did on the motherboard. If you're using HDMI, exactly the same principle, plug it into the HDMI connection, just like that. Again, simple rule. If you plug it into your motherboard and lots of people make that mistake, don't get me wrong. I've had to fix many PCs for people where they've done that. You will get low performance. And suddenly, once you plug it into your graphics cards, you'll notice a world of difference. So definitely remember that one. When it comes to USB connections, just like on your mouse, and this is our mouse here, you will want to plug them into the motherboard I.O. You can also plug them onto the I.O. on the front of the case. This one is on the top. But generally, you can get away with plugging them in the back. You will get different colored I.O.s and USBs here. So the blue ones mean USB 3 usually. The black ones mean USB 2. A mouse and keyboard will work in any of them and it should work perfectly fine and all you do is you just slot them in as you would do with any kind of usb stick so once you've got everything connected up of course we just need to turn the machine on so let's get it swung around and then we'll show you what is next if you have built your own gaming pc the first time you boot it it's not going to get anywhere because you won't have an operating system installed it's very easy to install things like windows windows 11 is actually currently running on this machine and all you need to do is head over to the microsoft website download its installer tool, run that tool on another system to build a USB stick, and then just drop it into the system and follow the instructions on there. You should actually go through a process of going through things, uh, setting up your storage device, setting up your accounts on there, and then ticking like a billion boxes, uh, depending on whether you want Microsoft to scan your data and stuff like that. But eventually you will get into Windows. Now that we're into the operating system, there are a few things that you need to do. Unlike a games console, which comes pre-configured and then it pre-updates itself and it's got all the drivers and everything built in, you will need to do that kind of stuff on your own. It's not a daunting task at all. It's very simple, particularly if you're using Windows. If you've gone the Linux route, which is a different type of operating system, it's actually free. So lots of people are starting to do that nowadays. It's a little bit more complex because it depends on the distribution that you've got and things like that. But we're sticking with Windows because that's most commonly what people are going to use. The one thing you will need to do is get drivers for your graphics card. You can also get all of the drivers from the motherboard manufacturer to make sure that you've got your chipset drivers for your CPU. We've already done that on this one. You can also go and get things like your LAN drivers to make sure they're up to date, your sound drivers, all that kind of stuff. This system is, of course, completely up to date. And in my opinion, if you bought a pre-built system, they should have already done that work for you. If they haven't, you should probably get onto the phone to them because that's not good enough. Of course, sometimes they do reset the system, which resets your graphics card drivers. So you will need to go get that. And to be honest, it's probably best to do it anyway, because you don't know how long these machines have been sitting on shelves and things. And graphics drivers are always rapidly changing. They can make the world of difference when it comes to gaming performance. For us, it is an NVIDIA graphics card. So all you would need to do is just head over to NVIDIA website, drop onto their website here and straight away on the search it's gone to their driver lists you will need to go to this manual driver search find the graphics card you got for us it's the rtx 3060 ti and download the game ready drivers run it like any installation on windows and it should go through all the process and you'll be good to go for amd it's exactly the same process you just go to amd.com and then you will go over to i think it's a support tab so there's a resources and support tab drivers and it's the same process again. Go through, select your graphics driver, select your graphics card, download the latest, in my opinion, recommended drivers. Don't kind of download their beta ones because if you get any issues, you don't know whether it's a system or if it's the uh, drivers themselves. Get the recommended ones and you're always pretty much good to go. This is now actually running. The next thing you need to do is obviously get your games on a PlayStation or an Xbox. It's really easy. You can either pop to the shop and buy them in a box, slap the disc in and off you go. 
or you can go over to their stores and you can download a game you can purchase it and download it and it'll be stored onto your system in the world of pc gaming everything is technically like that you will go to a store and you buy everything digitally and you store them on the storage device on your system it's just that you actually have a lot more options than you do on a games console you can get lots of different launches out there from different manufacturers and um, publishers and things like that the most common one of course is a distribution system called steam that's the one that i generally run but you can get the ea app which used to be called origin you can get the epic games app that will allow you to purchase games you can get the gog app which is actually a pretty decent one i like that one because they actually give you the ability to completely own your games it's not just licensing you can download the literal files like you used to have to do or you can use their launcher to install them that way there's also the Ubisoft app. It's not one that I generally use too often, but you can do that. It depends what type of games you play and where you want to get them from. And all you need to do really is install Steam very quickly. To get Steam, if you are going to be using Steam, I would always recommend going with Steam as a, as a basic thing. But what you want to do is you want to search for Steam Powered. Head over to the Steam Powered website. Hit your Install Steam in the top right hand corner and then click install steam that will actually download a small exe when you run that it will download steam it'll install steam and then you'll be left with a login screen once you've logged in you will actually see uh, the store so you can go purchase things or you can go into your library and you can see all the games you own if i just open up this little folder here because i create my own little folders you can see that i've got lots and lots and lots and lots of games that i've owned and purchased over the years the next stage in your pc gaming adventure i suppose in your life cycle will be that you will want to upgrade your pc this is another big bonus to pc gaming over console gaming and definitely one of the reasons or one of the core reasons why lots of people get into it you can now upgrade this system in lots of different ways with the playstation you're stuck with the playstation if it starts to run slow because games are getting better you're kind of stuck there with the pc you just upgrade different things this system in particular we could upgrade the CPU here. It's an AM4 based system, so it's a little bit old now, but it's it's decent. But we could update the CPU to something that's faster, get a little bit more FPS out of it. We could definitely update or upgrade the graphics card. It costs a little bit more to be able to do it, but we will get a lot more FPS out of it. And of course, when things start moving up the resolutions, upgrading your system will allow you to do that too. So there we go. This is a very simple and basic guide on what you need if you are moving from something like a games console to a gaming PC, or if you've never gamed on either of them and maybe you want to just get into gaming, but you don't want to be locked down to a single ecosystem or pay a fortune for just a basic games console. This is every piece of information that you really need. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you like this kind of content. And also let me know in the comments below the things that I missed. I'm sure I missed a lot of things here. We didn't want to go into too much detail because there's a lot of fine tuning you can do on your hardware in your BIOS and things like that on a PC, which you can't do on a console. With that in mind, we're then starting to talk about things like overclocking and stuff like that. I'm not a big overclocking fan. I don't really know how to do it, but there's plenty of videos out there that you can watch from others where you actually get to do that kind of stuff. That's where you can make your system faster for free so you don't need to actually pay to upgrade things you can do that on a pc you most definitely can uh, and i'm sure as always i'll catch you guys in the next one <laughs>